Welcome to This Week in Health IT, where we discuss news information and emerging thought with leaders from across the healthcare industry. This is episode number 28. Today, we discuss the CIO's role when M&A is in your future, uh, plus uh, the consumer, the consumers are demanding more from healthcare. Today, we look at uh, where those specific areas are and what a CIO might do about it. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by Health Lyrics. Are your strategies constrained by infrastructure or are you tied to a knot of applications? We've been in your shoes. We've been moving health systems to the cloud since 2010. Find out how to leverage cloud to new levels of efficiency and productivity. Visit healthlyrics.com to schedule your free consultation. My name is Bill Russell, recovering healthcare CIO, writer, advisor with the previously mentioned Health Lyrics. Before I get to our guest, an update on our listener drive. We've exceeded 200 combined new subscribers between our YouTube and podcast outlets, which means we've raised $2,000 for Hope Builders, which provides disadvantaged youth life skills and job training needed to achieve enduring personal and professional success. I've hired their graduates. Their stories are really amazing. Uh, we have five more weeks where our sponsor will give $1,000 for every additional 100 subscribers. Join us by subscribing today and be a part of giving someone a second chance. Uh, today's guest is, is uh, not new to the show, second, second time guest. Today's guest is former Chime CIO of the Year and now serves as a principal at uh, Starbridge Advisors, a veteran CIO, Brigham and Women's, University of Michigan Health System, uh, interim at University Health, our University Hospitals in Cleveland, Stony Brook in New York, and uh, as I said, principal at Starbridge Advisors. The wonderful Sue Shade joins us. Good morning, Sue, and uh, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Bill. Good to be here, and uh, uh, look forward to our conversation today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. I uh, we were just actually before coming on the air, we were lamenting the fact that we don't have our huge teams of <laughs> IT staff to run in and help us. We're we're gonna we're gonna struggle through some audio challenges today because we we don't have those wonderful people uh, around because we're both actually working out of our homes today um, so we might hear a dog bark in your background we might see painters uh in our, our the office right now is getting painted behind me so if somebody walks by just just let me know uh, so uh, so you, you, the last time you were on the show february 2nd was uh was a long time ago you were one of the early pioneers on the show um do you remember do you remember what we talked about back then? Yeah, that's a trick question. I do not. Whatever, <laughs> whatever was current that day, that exactly. week, I, I don't remember. Well, yeah. that, that's why we call it This Week in Health IT. So it's, uh, right. man, I'll tell you, and the, the show has changed a little bit since the last time you were on. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But one of the things that hasn't changed is we like to ask our guests, you know, what, what's something they're excited about or, or what they're working on today? So. Uh, so what's what's going on in your uh, in your world right now? Sure, uh, I'll mention a couple of things. One thing I'm looking forward to is um, a conference I'm going to in DC next week, which is Health Impact East, and it's a kind of smaller size conference that's going to have several focus areas. I'm going to participate on a panel around patient-centered innovation, and uh, probably participate in a few other events as well. So looking forward to doing that. Uh, meeting some new people and having some interesting conversations. Another thing I'm working on right now, I'm kind of excited about, uh, in fact, had a call this morning with two colleagues, is uh, trying to figure out some um, offerings in the coaching space targeted specifically to women leaders at different points in their career. So I'll just say stay tuned on that. Coaching is something I'm passionate about, um, and we'll see what we can do with, with that potential. Uh, and I am coaching uh, two new people as of recently, one in the uh, career planning kind of mode and another one who is a new CIO in their organization and um, dealing with all those kinds of things that you deal with when you are very experienced, but you come into an organization and a new culture and a new set of people and a new set of challenges. So uh, a couple of things I'm working on and excited about these days. Well, that's fun. I, the coaching thing is is interesting to me because I've now – I've uh, been pulled into uh, a couple contracts on that, and I'm actually coaching a CEO uh, on technology decisions and directions, and it's it's really fun. I mean, uh, it's it is really challenging. I mean, you you really have to come up to speed pretty quickly on on the dynamics of the organization, but uh, right. just the nature of the number of people we talk to, the number of organizations, the amount of experience we have, um, we end up being able to have some uh, very 
good conversations with people in executive positions, guide them, coach them, uh, give them direction. What would you say is the distinction between coaching and consulting? Oh, <laughs> well, coaching is a one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship with someone and really looking at what their strengths and weaknesses are, what, what uh, gaps they might have as a leader and how you help them to um, grow and develop. Whereas consulting, you know, well, consulting can be anything from a project to an assessment to, you know, and it can be with a team of people, it can be with one, you know, I, it, I, if it's with one leader, it's probably advisory services, but yeah, yeah. interesting question. And one, one of the things I, I say to people is, you know, the, the coach of a basketball team never gets on the floor. So if you're, ask, ah. if you're asking me to do work and to get on the floor and to mix it up with your team and to do those kind of things, I mean, some of those things you can do like in timeouts and whatnot, but you, you're never taking any shots and you're never doing that kind of stuff. That's consulting. That's advising. But coaching is more along the lines of, you know, hey, what are the, what are the three to five technologies we should be keeping an eye on this? Uh, we're thinking of creating new roles within IT, what do you think? I mean, it's, it really is coaching. It's, it's what you think mm -hmm. it does. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, new directions uh, for me, definitely, and you've been doing it for a while. Um, so, okay, so we do three things on the show, uh, in the news, sound bites, and social media close. So uh, in the news, we each pick a story to discuss. Uh, I'll go first. And uh, okay. I'm I'm always looking to have this conversation with somebody and it's hard because uh, if you have it with an active CIO, they, a lot of them are in the middle of these kinds of acquisitions and they're not really free to, to talk about it. So I wanted to talk M&A with someone and since neither one of us are actively CIOs, we're working with CIOs, I thought it would be good to have this conversation with you. So I pulled the Kaufman Hall report. Uh, you can download it off the kaufmanhall.com uh, website. Uh, they're an advisor, uh, advisory services to, uh, to health systems. And they have their 2017 in review year, uh, the year m and shook the healthcare landscape. So it's a little older report, but 2017 is not that long ago. And here's some of the things they, they came up with. 115 transactions announced in 2017, highest number in recent history. 10 transactions involve sellers with net revenues of a billion dollars or greater, representing the largest uh, number of mega deals ever recorded. Uh, largest regional healthcare uh, transaction is Advocate in Aurora in Illinois, nearly 11 billion, uh, creating the 10th largest not-for-profit. Um, and just an odd statistic, but Pennsylvania had 14 deals, Georgia had nine deals, Texas had eight deals, uh, most active states. Um, I thought one of the more interesting things was, you know, in 2015, there was 112 transactions, but in uh, 2017, there's 115. But the transaction, transaction revenue has doubled. So in, in the 112 tr transactions in 2015 represented $32 billion in revenue. Uh, the 115 transactions in 2017 represent $63 billion in revenue. So we're seeing uh, a growth in those kinds of things. And we can rattle off all the different uh, health systems that are going through it. It's, it really, it's across the, uh, across the, the industry. So um, here's what I'd like to do with you. Um, I'd like to role play. So let's let's say we're CIOs of two health systems that are coming together. You can be the uh, you can be the larger health system because it matters. You'll you'll mm -hmm. be the larger health system CIO. I'll be from the mm -hmm. smaller, smaller system, and let's discuss process thinking and approach to to various stages uh, of the merger. So here's a, a couple more assumptions. CIO um, the CIO or IT was not involved in the negotiations. I know you find that hard to believe, but it happens. And, uh, <laughs> Not at all. And there's been little to no due diligence as a result of that. The merger is slated to take about six months from the time it's announced. Uh, but we both know that the regulatory environment, uh, they, you, know, you can't bank on this, but typically it takes longer than six months to pull it off. Um, I know that the, the Providence St. Joe's merger I went through took a little over nine months, uh, closer to 10 months uh, to pull off with a six month announcement. So. Uh, let's start with an announcement day. So, uh, this is pre-merger. It's announcement day. It's, it's announcing intentions. Uh, you're, you're the larger health system. So you get to go, go first. What's on your mind? What are some of the things you need, you think we need to do first and, and what are some things you're going to ensure that gets done? Okay. Great question. Uh, and 
it is not surprising that IT may not be involved in the due diligence, um, as I already commented <laughs> when you said that. Um, so obviously, doing the IT due diligence and trying to tee that up has to be one of the first things. But even before that, I think it's critical that the CIO, in this case, me for the large organization, for the small organization, fully understand what are the business drivers, what is behind this merger, and they take different forms. Um, you talked about some of the bigger ones, but the scenario you're giving me here is probably the more typical, where there's a merger, a small organization coming into a large organization, right? But to understand the business drivers first, I think that um, as an approach, you need to think that the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And what are we both bringing into this equation that we're gonna that we're gonna want to leverage? So I think that's critical. Um, and you know, I think we've all been there. You start thinking about your roadmap and the order at which you would by which you would integrate systems, assuming that that's part of the plan. Starting with all the review of the infrastructure and network, that's typically first. Then, so that the organization can operate as one, you, you deal with all the financials, right? And last, if you get to it and you need to get to it, given patient and, and clinician integration and workflow, you know, are you going to, what are you going to do to integrate clinical system? Um, yeah. And always, always with the focus on the patient. You know? And again, it, it depends on, um, it depends on the makeup of the organization. I just heard about a, uh, merger yesterday that I had not yet read about in the news, though I think it's public um, that it's happening, that was a very unique one, and I'm not sure how to have to think at this point about patient flow, but typically in a merger, you're, you're dealing with patient flow. Yeah, and I, I think, point. yeah, I mean, that's, that, that is a good starting place. There's, there's so many things to do um, that, you know, I, again, I, I, I did go through this, so I was, I was part of a merger team uh, bringing a six billion dollar health system together with a thirteen billion dollar health system, uh, which today is a twenty two billion dollar health system. So, and again, went through the nine month process of all the planning and whatnot. And and to be honest with you, you really have to slow things down. Uh, it's a day to day kind of thing. The first thing uh, I found to be important again. Now I'm the CIO of the smaller entity. Uh, communication is your first job. Uh, for the CIO of the acquired entity. And the number one thing people want to know is, what does this mean for my job? Because the larger entity, they're not as concerned because they're like, hey, we're the, you know, we're the big, we're in charge here. Um, now that may not be the stated intention, but yeah. everyone who's ever watched this from afar says the larger entity will take over. And to be honest with you, in, in our case, it was stated, you know, uh, a merger of equals, and uh, that was not the case. It never, it, it almost never is. I don't want to burst anyone's bubble or any CEO who happens to be listening to this saying, no, no, we're a merger of equals. That's never the case. At some point, some entity sort of, the board sort of make their way and it sort of figures out. So my team is trying to figure out what does this mean for me? So I have to know the story. You talked about the business drivers. I have to know the story. Why is this good for the health system? Why is it good for the community? And then eventually I have to tell the story of why is it good for them? And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because you don't want to overstate, you don't want to overstate, uh, you know, hey, there's a job for everybody, but literally there's enough work for everybody. That's, that's, that's a given. Um, but there will, be, there will be overlap in some areas. So you don't want to overpromise, but you don't want to underpromise because I've also seen people really thrive uh, from the smaller entity into the larger entity and take on larger roles and really almost get found in the process and really uh, escalate to good roles. So uh, it's it's not all doom and gloom like some people think. If you take the right attitude and mindset into it, develop good relationships and do the job that you're capable of doing. Uh, and, and so that's the that's the number one thing is, is communication. Um, and the second thing I'm worried about on that first day is relationships. I'm trying to uh, figure out, okay, from a relationship standpoint, obviously you're the, you're the larger organization CIO. I want to have a relationship with you. So uh, if you don't reach out to me, I'm definitely reaching out to you. Um, 
I need to, I need to know that leadership team on the other side. I need to, uh, I need to start helping my organization to understand who their counterparts are on the other side. Um, I'm reading as much as I can because again, you know, some of, some of the people who are doing mergers have been on this show. You could listen to the CIO talk and get an idea of their philosophy and their direction. Um, so I'm reading as much stuff as I can to really understand their philosophy. Um, so that when people ask me questions like, Hey, do you think they'll have regional CIOs? Do you think they'll keep you around as a CIO? Do you think I can have some semblance of an answer? Like, you know, you know, historically they don't have regional CIOs. This might change. I don't know. It, who knows what it is. Um, so th those are probably the, the first two things to be honest. I slow it down a lot because the next set of questions people start asking is, uh, you know, technical questions, uh, security questions, clinical workflow questions. Are we going to change our EHR? And you can't answer that thing for another nine months probably um, because there's way too many things to consider here. How are the clinical organizations going to come together? Is there going to be a common clinical governance? Is there going to be um, how different are your EHRs? Maybe you're on the same EHR but different instances now. Um, you know, maybe they're very similar. There's, there's so many things. So let's talk about, let's talk through some of those actually. So you, you brought them up. Uh, technical security and clinical considerations. We'll come back to some more people stuff in a minute. So technical, clinical, and security considerations. How, how are you thinking through uh, those things um, early on in the process or even mid, mid process? Let's say we're three months in. How are we starting to bring our teams together think about those things, what, what areas are, are the most important? You, you know, you have to go back to the question of business drivers. And, you know, typically in a merger, there is an assumption that you're going to be able to reduce the cost, right? So yeah. you start with the foundational pieces in terms of your data centers, your network, uh, what opportunities do you have to consolidate on the infrastructure front past just uh, merging those together and, and doing some level of uh, consolidation? Actually, can you drive any costs out? You, you, you know, one of the organizations may be in the process of a cloud migration. The other one may be, you know, not even thinking about that. Uh, there may be new data centers, you know, under, under construction, right? Physical physical data centers. So I mean, you just really, in the due diligence, have to start looking at what's the current state, what's everybody planning to do, what do you need to stop, what do you need to start looking at uh, that you might be doing together. There, you know, there's no rocket science to it. I don't want to minimize, but it's, you know, that's all part of the due diligence, figuring that out. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, the, um, there are some things that you're going to need on, on the first day. It's really interesting to me. So on the first day, you don't even have an agreement. You haven't even come together and people are already going to start asking you like, Hey, how do we do shared calendaring? How do we do? Yeah. It's serious. How do we do shared calendaring? Yeah. How do we do conferencing? Yeah. What's our conferencing solution? What's our, I mean, they start and you're sitting there going, our, our security teams haven't even met each other yet. Right. Um, and actually this is where the cloud comes in. It's, it's interesting because when you bring these two organizations together, you're like, well, we have this and we have this but you haven't tied them together, sometimes it's almost safer to go to a cloud solution, a third party cloud solution and just say, you know what, organizations do this all the time. They, they're still separate entities. We haven't done the due diligence on security. We don't wanna just slap these networks together. There's just too many, too many variables. So uh -huh. let's, go ahead and, let's go ahead and fire up Zoom like we're using right now. This is not an ad for them. It's just one of many. Or, or, you know, or Microsoft solution or whatever. Let's go ahead and fire that up in the cloud and we'll start using that for our video conferencing between, because it works. I mean, right now there's so many cloud solutions that give you that, that base level of, of uh, interoperability and connectivity. Um, and, then, and then you almost need to slow people down because um, they want to start talking, you know, are we going to go to a single identity system? Are we going to go to a single EHR? Are we going to go to, um, you know, how are we going to bring these things together? And just Focus on the things you need to get done in order to get to that day, the, the, the merger day. Because um, really, there's a whole bunch of things you can't even do until that, the paperwork's done and signed. 
Um, right. And so there's part of me that says, uh, you know, technical security and clinical, it's all people. It's all people and culture for those, for those six to nine months. So let's talk about culture. How, well, actually, let's start here. Let's talk about our first conversation. You're the acquiring CIO. I'm the, I'm the smaller entity CIO. What are some things in our first conversation, what are some things you think you want to know from me? And what are, what are some things I, I, and I'll tell you some of the things I would ask of you. Okay. So uh, I want to get to this because I think this is so critical. Culture really matters and the people and the relationships as you've already talked a little bit about. So uh, especially if you are, if you are the, the, uh, I've used the term big dog, and, and maybe that's bad to say, but you know, if you're the larger entity, you're the big dog, there's a perception, right? I've, I've, been, I've been told in one situation, um, they, the, the, the CIO of the smaller entity thanked me for meeting with him at his location, like 40 miles from where I was, and said, you know, for people to come down from the ivory tower, because there was an academic character there, I mean, he was surprised that I came and met with him at his place. And um, I just think those dynamics, like what you say, what word you use, you don't call it the IP tower, right? You don't call yourself the big dog, any of those things, right? You may be perceived as all those things, but from the beginning, I'm beginning to know you. I want to know um, your style, you know, what you're doing with your team, what's important to you right now, what are your concerns uh, today, what are your concerns going forward with the merger? all about the people skills building that relationship and the rapport that we're going to be working together and we don't know right bill how it's going to shake out at the end of the day what your role is going to be what my role is going to be what your people's role is going to be or what my people's roles are going to be so you know you just have to say for the greater good this merger is going on we all serve patients right it's what we're about and uh we're going to figure out how to do this together yep. uh, it has to be a partnership and it shouldn't be a threatening kind of relationship yeah, and by the way, that gesture of the the acquiring the big dog CIO coming to the other location that I, I can't emphasize enough how big of a deal that is and what that communicates. Um, uh -huh. It communicates a certain level of humility, a certain level of awareness. Um, plus, uh -huh. if, if you come to my location, uh, we can now start to introduce you to people in a pretty informal setting and. Um, and start to put because my team's less at ease than your team i mean they're they're like oh we're the small entity and, and you coming right. down meeting them and i'm i'm able to to really start to um to just calm things down and that's the the number one thing i'm doing on my end is just keeping people focused on the job at hand um making sure that uh, hopefully in it organizations today we don't have too many people that are completely indispensable but making sure those people that have critical roles uh, are are not like spending half their day with resumes and and on LinkedIn and whatnot, but actually focused in on their job and, th and those kinds of things really help. The other thing that really helps is just a an ongoing dialogue between you and I, so that uh, I can get questions answered. You know, what what does your data team look like? What does your analytic strategy look like? So that when my data team comes in and they go, you know, you know. How, how do they think about these things? I can start to answer them until we get to that point where we're bringing the teams together. So, uh, You know, one thing that I would add, especially because you said in this scenario, IT was not involved in the due diligence, there, there is someone driving this merger from both of our organizations. There is a point person. And you as the CIO need to be very close to them. You need to understand everything that you can about what's gone on already, what are the issues, what are the concerns, so that when you walk into that situation for the first time and start talking CIO to CIO, you've got that big framework and you've got that context. The other thing is the people component is so critical, you've got to be right there with the um, HR leads for each organization as they're starting to talk about and think about how might things change. You know, are there going to be new operational models, what is it going to be in terms of staffing, etc. Um, and you're never figuring that out independently as a CIO. It's, it's part of a larger organization discussion. So let's, because um, I, I need to bring, we could talk about this for the next 45 minutes or next yeah. two days, really. Yeah. But, 
the, so th let me close with this question, which is we're bringing our teams together. What's, uh, how, do you, how do you prepare your team for their first meeting with our team? So we're gonna bring our infrastructure teams together, our innovation teams together, our data teams together, and we're gonna have, we're gonna have a common meeting. How do you sort of prepare them? What's the, uh, I don't know, how, how do you make sure that that first meeting goes well? Well, I will go back to what we've already talked about in terms of the relationship and the dynamic between the larger and the smaller organization um, in prepping people and, and helping them understand and message. Um, what I would emphasize with people is that change is constant and we don't have all the answers. Um, your communication is critical. Uh, I subscribe to you know the approach that you tell people what you know when you can. Uh, you tell people if you don't know, if you don't have answers yet, you tell them you don't and when you might. And if you have information that you can't yet share for whatever reason, you tell them, yeah, we, we do know that, we've made that decision, but it, it, we can't go public yet. Um, I'm a big subscriber to the philosophy or to the belief that uh, that lack of information, that people make stuff up. That's how all the rumors start, right? It yep. just goes round and round. So if people aren't getting any regular proactive communication, they're going to make stuff up. And then, and then you just have to try to manage that. What I uh, would also, obviously with the advice of HR, how do you talk about um, future work? And on the one hand, you can message, there's plenty of work for everybody. We know that. On the other hand, you have to say no guarantees as to whether there'll be Change, changes or staff reduction. You know, and HR tells you what to say and how to say it, what not to say. The other thing, my message to individuals, because individuals get really worried at a time like this, is twofold. One, open to the possibilities. Who knows what changes there's going to be and what new opportunities, new jobs, new skills, you know, they can learn. So be open to the possibilities. The other thing I tell people is you own your own career. So depending on what those possibilities are and those changes, if you like them, if you don't like them, if you want to propose, you put me in this role instead, you know, every individual owns their own career. Yeah, and that's why you're a great uh, career coach for people looking uh, for some guidance in that area. Uh, the, the thing, uh, bringing the teams together, there was a couple things that um, I thought were non-negotiables. One is uh, one of the leaders had to, address the IT team, especially since there's no due diligence. IT might feel slighted, the fact that there was no uh, due diligence and that kind of stuff. So one of the leaders uh, being there and saying, you know, technology is critical, digital is the future of healthcare, all those things that we all know is true, uh, just reinforcing that these two teams coming together. They also need to re reinforce the message, which is we brought it together, and the business drivers, right? We brought it together because we believe that the new entity will be stronger together than it was apart, um, which means we're looking to this group to figure out what things we're doing the best. And it might not be that the larger entity is doing everything the best. And it might not be uh, that the, you know, and we want to take best of each and make something better. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the last thing to prepare my team for the conversation is to just set realistic expectations. And it is every healthcare IT organization has warts. And so I, I, don't, I don't want like this big deluge of people coming into my office like, do you know that they have these issues? It's like, of course they have these issues. It's a $13 billion organization. Do you know how hard it is to run our $6 billion organization? We have warts, they have warts, the, the goal is, uh, you know, if people can be honest and you can remove the fear from that situation and we can develop something better. And that's really one of the key things I would leave people with is as the leader of the IT organization, you have to figure out a way to remove fear um, from the equation because people do dumb things when they act out of fear. And, uh, yep. and so that's where communication becomes key. Again, yeah, I, love I bet you're going to print. I bet you're going to transition us. Can I say one other thing? Please. Um, before we transition, um, uh, you know, and, and some of the people listening to this probably know that I write a weekly blog called Health IT Connect. And um, 
I have written a couple blogs around the issues of uh, mergers and acquisitions. One was Merger Mania, where I talked about uh, making sure we're doing it right for the patient. Another one was about culture, which gets at what we were talking about in terms of the dynamic between people, and it's really about respect. Um, and the other one was about uh, corporate functions, but local service, and that challenge, whether it's a result of a merger or, or just a very large system that's grown, uh, making sure that you understand the unique needs of all the players within your organization. Yeah, uh, it's a great blog, and I will be coming back to that in the uh, soundbite sure. section. No. Um, sure. Now, unfortunately, which means we have this story, uh, your story, we're probably going to shortchange a little bit because we spent so much time on, on the merger, but okay. uh, heat up for us. Okay. Sure. So um, the story that I found and want to talk some about is called uh, Patients Are Losing Their Patients. So two spellings, patients are losing their patients. Seven ways healthcare consumers are demanding more. Um, this is an article written by Barbara Smith, a partner in uh, Peregrine Consulting Partners. And um, I think it's just spot on. I'll go quickly. Spot on as she um, draws the analogy between uh, entering into the healthcare environment from a patient perspective and, um, uh, in her case, um, a sporting event and everything surrounding a sporting event from a customer friendly perspective. But of the seven areas, if I can just highlight them, efficient Please. patient workflow, we, you know, patient workflow, we talked about clinicians workflow, right? But patients workflow or flow, ease and scheduling, ease of access, transportation, parking, and electronic access, which having worked in some very um, congested urban environments, I get that one fully. Um, the fourth one is patient experience with wait times and other annoyances. Uh, fifth one is transparency and pricing. Uh, she's got an interesting analogy there about dropping off your car. You wouldn't drop your car off for service if you didn't know what you were getting into, right? What's it going to cost me? Yep. Uh, and quality metrics is six. Um, she points out you don't go to a restaurant probably now without checking a Yelp review, right? So what do you know about the organization that's going to be doing care? And her last one is about free the report, which has to do with getting um, results to patients and in a timely manner. Uh, and, you know, I think as I, as I read this article, what I was thinking, Bill, is, you know, I think CIOs, all of us know we need to be doing this. And we're hearing it a lot from the executives uh, in the C-suite. The question is how? How do, how do CIOs address it and where do they start? So I'll throw that. I've got some thoughts on that. I'll throw that to you. Wow. I'm, I'm being asked the question. Um, you know, it's interesting because okay. I agree with you. I think this is spot on. Uh, patient workflow, scheduling, uh, ease of access, ex uh, uh, wait times, other annoyances, uh, experience, transparency and pricing, quality metrics, and, and uh, access to the report and the data. These are, these are it, it's a pretty good, um, and I, I, how would I start? I'd start by, uh, creating that, uh, again, I keep saying creating the narrative, but creating the story that the organization can sort of to, to rally around. I find that um, people don't rally around PowerPoints, they rally around stories. And to the, to the extent that you can start collecting stories, uh, good, bad, or indifferent from your patients that talk about their experience in terms of work workflow. We've been asked this question 10 times, we've been bounced around, or somebody with a chronic condition that you know, whatever, I, the organization can respond to that. They can look at it and go, yeah, that shouldn't be true of our organization. I don't want that to be true of our organization. And then they can mobilize around it. So I, I always start uh, with the story. The scheduling one sort of cracks me up. My story around that is we, we had, and I've shared this before, in our, uh, our portal, we had this list of things and we had, you know, the medical record was number one and scheduling was like number six. And when we talked to the patients, scheduling was number one. Scheduling is so difficult. Uh, scheduling referrals and, and that whole process. Um, and what all we did, all we had to do was talk to patients. They gave us the list, and we said, as much as the internal anecdotal was, no, no, this is the most important thing. We're like, no, look, we talked to, we we actually conducted a study. We talked to a thousand patients and this is what they're telling us is most important to them. So no one in the organization can now create a false narrative that says, no, no, they care more about this medical record. No, no, what they care about is 
access, scheduling, work. For, they really do care about these things. And I think I think she is uh, spot on on this. So what what are some areas, or uh, what are some of your thoughts on this on this list of the seven areas for patient uh, experience improvements? Well, uh, you know. You, you talk about scheduling and how hard it is, but that's a critical one. Um, let me take it from the let me take from the point of view of the question I asked you and what do I, what what I think it takes to get this done. Um, you know, one of my philosophies is that you have to leverage your core products as much as you can. So your core EHR vendors have offerings that you need to be looking at to do some of these things. And it's very possible that as the CIO, what you're dealing with is people in ambulatory or people in strategy are finding niche products and saying, let's go try all these things to answer some of these solutions. Uh, you don't want to be in that position where you're in react mode to all those niche products. So you also have to be partnering with all those folks, whoever's in charge of ambulatory, whoever is in charge of patient engagement or patient experience. Oftentimes the strategy people are, are driving some of this in terms of your digital health strategy. So you need to par partner with them as the CIO, help drive it, and make sure that they understand everything that can be done with your core products that are already there before you start adding in these niche products that then have to be integrated. Um, those, are the, those are the key points. Uh, I guess one other thing I would say is with everything else on your plate, this may be like, oh, yeah, we'll get to that when we get to it. But then you find yourself falling behind competition and in your market. So figure out a way to take some steps in some of these areas with focus team um, so that you get moving on it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You brought up the, you know, because some of our vendors have very uh, extensive amount of offerings. And I find CIOs fall into two camps. There's the uh, and, and some people that both of us are in contact with and really respect have taken your approach and said, yes, you know, our vent, <laughs> we're double paying for a lot of this stuff because we have all these different solutions and let's consolidate around this, this, you know, our EHR provider solution because it's already integrated and it works right. pretty well. Um, that's, that's one school of thought. And it's a, it's a very valid, very good rule, uh, school of thought because it's, it's highly efficient to go that route. And then there's the, the other route, um, and I find some players going in this route where they go, you know what, we need to differentiate. And if we just go to the market with my chart, we're not gonna be able to differentiate because everybody else in our market's using my chart. Um, and so they're looking to free themselves a little bit. And so they're putting you know new layers in between so that they can uh, innovate, not necessarily with big teams of developers, with small teams and, and whatnot. And we had uh, somebody on the show who talked about that, of how they, uh, you know, with a team of, uh, I think, three or four developers, they were able to build on top of Epic's um, APIs a completely different experience for their community. And so there, there's two paths to go, and it's, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, right. uh, but, yeah, I... It, it's amazing to me. I was shocked. You walk into healthcare and, and we did the inventory and we were like, we have 1,800 applications. And, and that, just, that just, it boggled my mind that it was that many applications. And then you realize that's the norm across the industry because we've, we've allowed it to sort of proliferate, I guess. Yeah. Um, all right, so this is the new section for you. We haven't done it this way uh, since you were on in February. So uh, soundbite section, one to three minute answers, five questions. Um, so we're just gonna put you on the hot seat. Um, you, you, the, the timeline's more of a guideline than, than, than a rule, but um, I'm not gonna have a buzzer over here if you're wondering. Um, all right, so first question. Speed dating? No, it's not. Uh, first question, you served, uh, for several different health systems as CIO, what do you think distinguishes the best performing IT shops from others? So you've seen a lot of them. What, what, what's the characteristics of the best ones? Okay. You know, it's basic. It's basic. Um, it's governance. And I'm always amazed how many organizations don't have good IT governance. It's, it's, it's effective alignment with the business and 
uh, engagement, appropriate levels of engagement by the senior leaders as sponsors on your major initiatives. And I think from an IT perspective, running IT, running the business, it's about core processes and standards. And, and again, you'll see organizations that, that struggle with a lot of those basics, unfortunately. Uh, on top of that, I would just say it's all about the people and the culture and um, you know the, the the people skills of the of the of the leaders. Yeah, the yeah, uh, that's a great answer. I mean, the leadership team, the processes, and uh, the governance. It, it's interesting how many organizations are stumbling because of poor or lack of governance, and it's just such a such a great place to start. Uh, mm -hmm. Second question for you. So um, this is, uh, it goes back a little ways, but I sat in one of your presentations on lean and it really was exceptional. Um, I'd love Thank to you. You take that uh, and do that presentation again. It was really good. So if, if you were stepping into a health system that wasn't practicing lean principles today, mm -hmm. I assume you would want them to give us sort of a, a quick roadmap of how you would get that program off the ground. Sure. Um, so First off, it's not one size fits all. It's not. And I think if you go into an organization as a lean leader and think you can just, you know, make certain things happen, um, you're not going to be able to. You have to read the people, you have to look at the culture, and you have to have some champions that will work with you from the beginning. People who have that experience have that way of thinking. Um, and then you start with what problems are there to solve? Where are some of the gaps? Because those are going to lead you towards uh, where you have opportunities to apply lean thinking. Um, when I uh, brought this in at uh, University Hospitals in Cleveland, when I was there in 16 for eight months as an interim, um, I covered the whiteboard in my office with key metrics, key processes, some of the gaps, and I just started creating what eventually became a visual board that we put out in the open area. Uh, along those lines, what were the key metrics that we needed to watch, what were the key initiatives that we needed to monitor together, et cetera. So I started early on planting the seed with the people who I knew would partner with me, um, and then they have to take it on and own it. So those are some of the key tips. I did write a blog about this too called uh, Lessons from an Aspiring Lean Leader, and it's probably a lot of the key points that you might have heard in that presentation. So yeah. That's another one. Uh, and I'm not sure how CIOs run their organization uh, without lean principles. I, I realize it's not one size fits all, but it's it's right. so it's it's so good and so basic. Um, uh, third question for you: Much has been made really about having a seat at the table for the CIO. Um, I, I'd just like to hear your your thoughts on the right reporting structure uh, or critical relationships that the healthcare CIO needs to foster in order to be effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a couple points. One, um, if you can't and don't report to the CEO, I think the COO is probably the best other C-suite leader to report to because the COO sees everything ultimately from an operational perspective and IT sees everything as well. So I, I have found that good alignment when I report to the COO. Um, the CFO. Uh, has a much broader role than they did at one point. They're not just counting the dollars. They have uh, a strategy role. They're often the point person for mergers and acquisitions. Um, you know, they're looking at, you know, new revenue opportunities as well as how to cut costs. Um, so, uh, important partner if you don't report to the CFO to work closely with the CFO. Um, obviously, for EHR implementations or optimization, the the, um, uh, the three-person leadership team of the CIO, CMO, and CNO are really critical. Um, those have to be good relationships. And CMO and the CNO have to have a very strong relationship. And I have learned from um, my husband, who is a minister, you can't fix a relationship that you're not in. And if your CMO and CNO don't get along, remember that one, right? Um, and don't get triangles into relationships either. So if the CMO and CNO don't get along well, which sometimes happens in organizations, it's very hard for you to have that strong three-person team. But do what you can to make that work. The last thing I would say is there's all these new roles that are coming in. Um, you know, the chief digital officer, the chief analytics officer, the chief innovation officer. 
Um, I tease for a later thing. Um, if you go into an organization and those roles are there, figure out how to work with those people um, and partner with them. If they're not there, figure out how much of that is going to be your role as the CIO. Yeah. It really, I mean, it's such a collaborative role and a convener kind of role that it's, uh, yeah. um, you, you really are, it's a relationship role. In fact, I had one person uh, say to me, you know, did you get into this because you love technology? I'm like, I got into technology because I love technology, but you don't become a CIO because you love technology. You, that's not the role. Uh, it's, yeah. it is, it's a people and a leadership role, and that's, that's what it is. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd love to top, touch on this subject uh, from you because I have two daughters and you helped me to think through this. So career advice for a female recent college graduate who wants to work in health IT and eventually be the Chime CIO of the year. What, what, what career advice are you giving uh, that person? Well, career advice. Um, as early as you can, find role models and mentors. You know, that's important. Um, I really like the article, The Confidence Gap that was in the Atlantic in 2014. I've used it in some of my presentations. Um, it's a lot of data, it's a quite a long article, but I think it, it helps um, everyone, women in particular, um, frame some of the issues that women face uh, around confidence. And I would also emphasize that there is no right path and the choices that you make are your choices and they have to be right for you uh, and your family. So, um, you know, it's your path in the long run and, and don't let anybody tell you what that path needs to be. You know, the one thing I've been talking to people about, um, and I forget uh, who was on the show that we were talking about this, but it's, uh, it's interesting that when um, a, a female executive and a male executive look at the role of the CIO, the male executive just says, well, I have two of the 10 qualities. I, I'm pretty sure I could do the job where a female goes, well, I only have six of the 10 qualities. I need to develop the other four before I can do the CIO. And it's such an interesting um, mind gap that somebody who has six of the qualities and somebody who has two, the person who, who has two thinks they're more qualified than the somebody who has six doesn't think they should put their name in the ring. And we, we almost need to keep encouraging people to say, you know what, let someone else, if you want the role, let someone else decide you're not ready for the role. Put your yeah. name in there. Yeah. What'd you say? What? Yeah, what just put, question there? just put just put your name forward. I mean, it's right, it's like, right, right. Um, yeah. it, I, I totally agree. And the article, the confidence gap, uh, and I think there's a book too, gets at a lot of that um, from a data and research perspective, but also how women um, need to put themselves forward and overcome that, and that they can. Um, last question. So you do write the weekly blog. I don't know where you find the time, but I appreciate that you write the <laughs> weekly blog at uh, suchet.com. Um, a couple of questions on that. Uh, you know, it's a personal blog. When, when, when did you start it and why is the first question? And then yeah. uh, given that it's your blog and brand, did you ever have concerns from your employers or did they ever put uh, restrictions on you uh, in, in uh -huh. terms of writing? When did I start? I started in June of 2014, so I've had four years now of weekly blog um, and the discipline. <laughs> uh, I was at University of Michigan at the time as the CIO for the hospitals and health centers. And when I had the idea as part of my whole social media push um, and wanting to share and teach and give back, is why I do it. Um, I was approached the social media coordinator in the PR department. And she was like, oh, perfect. I'd love more leaders to do this. So yes, let's do it. So they helped me set up the whole framework and kind of get started. Um, and uh, so it was under the University of Michigan at the time as a professional blog, but it was mine. Um, I, when I write, when I wrote then, I always thought there's four audiences. There's my staff and the blog does not replace messaging from me as a CIO if they read my blog great but how's the staff going to respond to anything I wrote how would any employee at University of Michigan Health System respond to anything and then the world of CIOs and IT leaders who are an audience and then everybody else so as I wrote I thought who am I 
who am I talking to and how are they going to relate to this? Um, to your question about any concerns, I um, told at the time what I said was, and I did it when I was at my interim role as well, um, I would use my judgment if I thought something I'm covering is going to be problematic or expose us in some way as an organization and I will take it to the right people. So I did one on a security culture and I took it to compliance and legal and I said, I don't think I'm exposing anything here about us that's problematic, but please double check. There was another one I did on an incident and the lessons from it and I wanted to make sure again, this is not exposing us the way I'm handling it is okay. So I just used my judgment on those and I told the leaders that I would. Um, I did at a certain point when I left Michigan transition and so you know, it's my branded blog and not under the Michigan banner. The other thing is if I touch on a political subject, which you know I do sometimes, um, I always am careful about how I approach that and there's a healthcare spin to it somewhere, somewhere in there. Yeah, and the reality is if you're gonna put yourself out there, if you're gonna write, uh, some people are gonna like it, some people are not gonna like it, and that's just the, the nature of the internet. Would you encourage other CIOs to uh, pick up this practice? If they um, are so inclined, but I would encourage them to find whatever form they can that they're comfortable with to share and teach others because we have a lot to offer as we continue to learn as leaders. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've uh, gone a little long. I apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> Sue, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, uh, we already mentioned some of them, but what's the best way for, pe for uh, people to follow you? Um, best way mention my blog, SueShade.com. I'm on Twitter, SG Shade is the handle. Um, I would say also uh, you can follow Starbridge Advisors. Uh, we have a blog called View from the Bridge. We're active on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. So any of those ways for uh, following and getting good content that we try to share. You are a, uh, you are one of my social media, um, <laughs> you know, pioneers who I'm, I'm trying to emulate. So uh, awesome. I've, I've got a couple ways you can follow, uh, follow me at the patient CIO, my writing on the health Eric's website. Don't forget the show on this at this week in HIT on Twitter. Check out the website this week in health and uh, catch all the videos on the YouTube channel. Uh, easiest way to get there. We're still not at a point where we can uh, get our own vanity URL. So it's this week in health slash video. Uh, we'll redirect you over to YouTube. And we are now up over uh, 200 videos uh, on there and, um, uh, and growing every day. So uh, please come back every Friday for more news, information, and commentary from industry influencers. That's all for now.